I greet you in the name of the Lord, and I want to say in the beginning that this location is very dear to my heart for the reason of 1996 when a young man, that young man was me, came here and I was newly saved, been saved about two years approximately, and I was newly married. And some of you that were here remember uh, my wife, little dark-skinned young lady, very short with a fur coat on. And we came here. And I found when I came here a people that I did not know existed. I didn't know there was such a thing as low German. And I didn't know there was such a thing as low German-speaking people. And I fell in love with you and Brother Corny and Sister Tina stayed at their home. Brother Peter was pastoring here. And I was thrilled to be a part of what God was doing. We sang songs in Low German. Unbelievable the gap and the distance from where I came to come here and just love the saints. I found a little bit about the history of you, and I won't go through all of that, but when I say of you, of the low German-speaking people that have gone through many persecutions, many tests, you've been ostracized, kicked out, given the worst land, died trying to do work, and somehow you've built up the means and ability to make wonderful things happen and to be successful in your colony. And... Then the Lord has called you out to the church of God. And the reason why we're here this evening is because you are not all the way out. And you will come all the way out tonight. Or you will get out tonight. And that's why we're here. I have never been one that is much accused of not being direct. I have never been one that has been accused of being difficult to understand in terms of not saying what I mean. I think people have difficulty understanding me sometimes. I would like to just speak to you briefly. How many of you heard, we had a service in Greenville on Saturday. How many of you tuned into that and would have heard that? Just a few? Okay, just a few. All right. So... In Greenville, I essentially began to preach from the book of Leviticus and began to explain how in God's economy, in God's economy, God does not permit anyone to be independently wealthy. And I'm going to ask you, if if I may, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you not to leave if possible and to pay attention to what we're saying if possible. I know we have children. So, God does not allow independent wealth in his community. As we read in Leviticus, God permitted his children to occupy his land, but the land was his. He said that it was his, and it was never owned by the people. It was rather owned by God. God is the creator. And because God is the creator... He reserves the right to say what happens in his world. God reserves the right, as God, to tell us what to do with his land in his world. I'm going to make that very clear. That is not really any of our business. That is the sovereign God's business. And because God is sovereign, he commanded his children to keep the seventh year Sabbath, among other things, where they would not plow their land or reap it or sow it. They do nothing, but they would let the the land rest. The people that apostatized did not apostatize because they loved idols. They did not apostatize because they loved rocks. Because they love sticks. 
because they love trees. We read in the Bible about idol worshipers. And idol worshipers, we look and we say, that is very foolish that they're idol worshipers. Who would bow down to a rock? Who would believe that a stone is God? The answer is, no reasonable human being would ever believe that a rock is God. And neither did they at that time. They worshipped idols as God because they refused to live and dwell and heed God's economy in Israel. They thought they knew better. They didn't want the land to rest. God allows no independent wealth. In God's economy, there can be no oppression. There can be no big man and little man in terms of I'm rich and you're poor. I'm not saying that everyone will have the same amount of money. What I am saying is God's economy is structured in such a way that men cannot rise up in that economy and have independent means outside of what God is controlling. God controlled all of their money, not just a tenth, not just an offering. God controlled all of their money. Now, the reason why we can shout and say amen, but the reason why they didn't like that or apostatize is because if you want your money to be yourself, yours own, your, yours alone, if you would like your money to be yours alone, then it's very easy to then call upon Baal. Because Baal, in Baal's economy, you don't have to do it like the church of God says. The church of God prevents Men from rising up and there being big wealthy men and little poor men and men with all kinds of land and men with other other men with no land. God tells them, release the land. Release the debt. It's a wonderful thing. Unless you just don't want to. And if you don't want to, well, then, of course, you could serve Baal or Ashtoreth. You can be in a grove. You can you can serve all those gods because those gods would not require you. To release your debt, your land. And so that's very important. In God's economy, it doesn't allow for independent wealth. These brethren are here, and they're not going to sit here and just listen to me. They're going to speak and help us. But this is just the opening here. Independent wealth, independent maneuvering of financial assets on your own, with your own mind, is the eighth beast. How would that be the eighth beast, brother? Because all of those heads that we learn about, all of them, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Grecia, Rome, you know all the studies that we've been doing for all this time? All of those heads exist. All of that structure exists through independent financiers that allow the system to be in place. And if it were possible, the eighth beast would live in the church of God. He would love to live in the church of God. As a matter of fact, it would be the most refined way he could live in the church of God. And so now I'd like to speak to you briefly about the global brethren. How many of you have heard of global brethren? Raise your hand, please. Okay. Some of you. Global brethren, the global brethren was a business that was constructed or that was enacted, it's a business entity, that was enacted initially just to, and I'm, these are in my words, just to help the local brethren in their businesses to help them in whatever ways they may need, including financially, help them on a local level, help businesses, those types of things. Help them with advice, help them with counseling, help them with some loans, just give them a good base to operate and have business support. 
That's what global, that's what the global brethren, in short, in brief, and I'm being brief intentionally, was designed to do originally. After the global brethren was established, the church of God, we began to preach about laying money down at the apostles' feet. In this locality, you know quite a bit about that. At least you know about that in words. Who in this locality has ever heard of someone say, we need to lay things down at the apostles' feet? Okay, everybody. Who's heard that we need to have one pot or one common, one common place where money is? Has anybody heard that in here? Few, few of you. Okay, good. After the global brethren was established and was given briefly for the reasons I mentioned, then we begin to preach as the church of God. God began to give us more understanding about how to preach about laying things down at the apostles' feet. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter two. We're not turning there intentionally. We can turn to any of these scriptures. I just choose to speak to you at this point. The Acts of the Apostles chapter 2, and if you go on to chapter 4, it speaks about how the saints sold their possessions, the extra things that they had, and they gave all of that entirely, that extra, to the apostles, and then distribution was made according as every man had need, just at the apostles' feet. There has been some confusion among us as to what that meant, and I, I hope with the help of God to alleviate some of that confusion now. It was thought that the global brethren entity, it was thought by some, not the apostles. It was thought by some that the global brethren business entity was the same as laying money down at the apostles' feet. It is not. Because it is not, There has been a great wave of discouragement that has swept across some of you. But the fact is that it's not. I'm going to explain to you with the help of God why it is not. And I would like you to understand it clearly. And I think that's only fair to you. In Elmer, and you you pardon me for for any details, if I say something and the detail was, you know, what have you, it wasn't left, it was right, get the spirit of what I'm saying. You'll, you'll, you'll find that I'm saying what's correct in spirit and in principle. In Elmer, the Global Brethren was established, and to my understanding, to the best of my knowledge, there were, there were some men that were assigned to oversee the affairs of the Global Brethren entity Locally in Elmer. Has anyone, anyone ever heard of that? Did anyone knew that? Ha- okay, good. You, good. So that has happened. There were some brothers that were assigned to carry on the affairs of the Global Brethren business entity locally in Elmer. Elmer went out and with the burden and they ha- with zeal and it was wonderful. And they established this uh, entity and this group or board of overseers or brethren that Brother Henry uh, gave them the charge of that just locally. Am I making sense? Okay. Am I making sense? Okay, good. Good. From there, businesses were going to be joined and started to be joined, and there was a very great excitement about what God was doing, and to many, the global brethren business entity They were moving forward with the vision of what they understood the apostles to be saying. They were, I'm going to say that again. They were moving forward with the vision of what they understood the apostles to be saying. Laying everything down at the apostles' feet. Some were struggling with the idea. Others were getting a hold of it, or at least they felt like they were. And they were endeavoring to do what they understood the apostles to be saying. That we would lay it all down. We'd put everything in this entity. Some were even going so far as to say we wouldn't even pick our cars. Some were going so far as to say, even right here. And I don't say this in a bad way. I say, I say Brother Corny's name, and I, I mean nothing bad by that. I, I mean nothing. This is not a reproof to Brother Corny. Brother Corny was right here, and we were hearing reports about how wonderful it was. He was going all over the place. Where'd you go, Brother Durango, Zacatecas, 
Campeche, I don't know where you went, all over the place. Talking about, let's get this together. Let's have, let's have one pot. And you know what you did. I'm saying this in your presence. And, and if I get something wrong, uh, you help me. But he was encouraged and spreading what he understood the vision to be. And he understood that with many others. This is not an attack on Brother Corny. I love him. It has nothing to do with that. But he understood with many others. I'm using him because it's a practical example. He's done this publicly. He's probably said this publicly here. Is that right? Okay, so we're all right. So we're on the same page. And so what happened was he was doing the best that he understood the vision to be. Let's have one purse. Let's get behind it. Let's do this. And the global brethren entity is the apostles' feet. That was never true. There was never one time where that was true. Many understood it to be so. But they just, they just were mis mistaken. And that's no problem. We're people. They were mistaken. I didn't get a lot of calls about that because, of course, I don't know anything about money at all. And so people wouldn't call me about that. But whomever they may feel comfortable with, whether that's a brother here or a brother there, they'll talk to them. And some of that's all right. Some of, some of that's all right. I understand We then went to, and I may get it, I'm just giving you some events. Don't mark when exactly, but I'm giving you a block of events that happened. We then went to Greenville meeting in February, and we began to preach about Vicarious Christi. We began to preach about the apostolic seats in Greenville meeting. You'll remember that. It was only February. We began to uh, preach about how we as apostles are sitting in the messianic seat, basically the seat of Adam. And from there, we occupy the place of Messiah on earth. Not that we are Messiah. We are not. But that Messiah placed us in this position in this world that Messiah created. We are not him. He placed us there to occupy that position in the world that he made. And so we preached that. We also preached in that meeting that the mystery was fully finished. Meaning that we understood that God's perfect plan was that he sent and signified the revelation by Jesus Christ to his angel. And that angel was the seventh trumpet apostolic ministry. And their job, our job, was to disseminate and to enlighten people with the revelation of Jesus Christ and reconcile all things in this world. Answer every question about where racism comes from, where false religion comes from, where all this oppression comes from. And that's done through the revelation of Jesus Christ by an apostolic ministry to gather together for God a people for his name and that's why we preached that in Greenville because it was an essential part of what God wanted to do and what God was doing so we had our duty our marching orders our job was to tell people and help them to know what the revelation of Jesus Christ was to reconcile or balance the books in their own mind to answer questions about what's been going on in this world to fix a distorted history that's been given to people by a beastly system. I'm going to say that again. Our job from the, from the messianic seat is to fix people's hearts and minds. Fix false history that was given to the people, to the masses, by a beastly system to twist and pervert their, thought, their thinking... And it was done by money. That's right. It was done by private money. That's right. That's right. And so people's hearts and minds begin to be shaped. One example real quickly before we move on. There are many people in the world, most in the world, believe that the Catholic Church was the first church, the original church. The reason they do is because a beastly system that was financed by independent financers to shape the minds of the masses, to keep them oppressed and keep them on top, told them that the Catholic Church was the first church. It's false history. And our job as the seven trumpet apostolic ministry sitting in, in the seat of Messiah is to reconcile those things to the world. 
thus causing an earthquake, helping the people to know that they have had a wrong perception, that a wrong image has been formed in their hearts and minds, and get them the help that they need. When we preached that way in Greenville, we were excited. Because it was the last part of the mystery. But everybody wasn't excited, and some of you here were totally discouraged. Some of you in this room were totally discouraged. Should I tell you why? I'm going to tell you why. Because we didn't mention anything about the Global Brethren in the Greenville meeting. We didn't mention anything about what's happening in Zacatecas. We didn't mention anything about the Yankees coming together. We didn't mention anything about the stirring in Chihuahua. We didn't mention anything about the stirring in Durango. We didn't mention anything about Elmer. And there were those in this room that were wondering what the apostles were doing and even went so far as to say, maybe we're just running ahead of the apostles. Maybe we're even pushing them. We're pushing the agenda. We have more faith in them than they have in them. Those words and words like that were said. Is everybody all right? And so some were discouraged at Greenville. <laughs> and they wanted, they wanted us to preach in the way that they thought proper. I'm going to say that again. They wanted us to preach in Greenville the way that they thought proper. And it's very ironic. I hope you understand what ironic means. It's very curious that they wanted us to preach that way because we were preaching about sitting in the messianic seat. And while we were preaching about how we sit in the messianic seat, there were those among you that sat in their own messianic seat and judged us falsely. Yes. Right. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes, sir. And what I would like to say is, if we were wrong and you're the apostle, why don't you produce what we did? Amen. There's a reason why Greenville went that way. And the reason Greenville went that way is because you needed to know that there's an apostolic seat and you're not on it. You needed to know that there is something that God's doing and you're not the one he's working through. And you didn't even pick that up. You just got upset. I hope I make you mad a little bit tonight because I traveled a long way and you're not more mad than me. And so, these brethren are going to talk. And so, that's not all. Then, we had a global brethren meeting. We went to Dallas and had a global brethren meeting. And some of you don't know that, but there was a lot of people there at the global brethren meeting. I found out later, the apostles had a meeting. Our chief apostle, Brother Tinsman, was there. We agreed to help the Global Brethren people and those that were encouraged, or at least falsely encouraged, help them to understand that the Global Brethren was not made for that. The Global Brethren was originally instituted to just help locally. And it's no problem to have a local board any more than it's a problem to have a local meeting house. It's no problem to help the Brethren locally. Of course you would help. You're a, you're a locality. You're a congregation. But that is not the equivalent of the apostles' feet. And so Brother Ray got up and said, and I'm going to tell you why, stay with me. Brother Ray got up in the Texas meeting and said that the global brethren business entity is not the apostles' feet. I rejoiced. I thought the point was made. I was happy. I left Dallas happy. Good that that was clarified. Later on, much later on, like four days ago, I found out that many people left so very deeply, disgustingly discouraged. So much so that they were ready to drop their messianic seat that they picked up in Greenville. And today, some people are sitting down without a vision, upset 
Because the Global Brethren business entity is not the apostles' feet. And they wanted, they wanted to lay down the, their things at the apostles' feet. They thought it was the global brethren, and now you tell us it's not, and now I don't know what to do. So I guess I'll just sit down and stick my lip out and be a little girl. And those actions prove that there was no real, evident, and lasting vision that was there in the first place. Because, brother, if you got a vision, your wife could leave you, and you'd still be sitting there. Brother, your wife could die and you still be sitting there. Amen. Somebody could say you're ugly and you still be there. Oh, yeah. But if somebody says something that you thought was different and now you're offended and don't know what to do, the fact is you never knew what to do. You should have been listening. The fact is you were not ahead of the apostles. You can't be ahead of the apostles. Amen. Because the apostles are first. Amen. Amen. We, we, just, we just move too fast. Then on top of that, Sister Opal preached a message and mentioned something about a healing. And some of y'all went crazy about that. Yes. I hope this is all right with you. I, 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 might, I might as well preach. I might as well say what's on my heart. Be, because, because we are in the end of time and I do believe it. Amen. Sister Oval gets up and makes a statement about the healing of our dear brother Froze. What is, and then there's some brethren to come and they say, wait a minute, she's backing out of it. The apostles are backing out of that statement. He's not healed yet. And if they don't believe that he's going to be healed, then I don't know how I can trust them whatsoever. Something like that. I'm right. I'm right. Some, something like that. Something like that. And what they don't realize is that the bullies, there were bullies in the camp of the saint. Do you know what a bully is? A bully is somebody that picks a fight that is aggravating to people. They don't know that Sister Opal was getting private texts. They don't know that. He's not healed yet. What do we do? We better pray. Not better yet. Text after text after text. They don't know that people were coming up to Sister Opal. I'm not suggesting they're not good brethren. I am suggesting that they might want to do good so they can stay good. Walking up to Sister Opal, saying things like, if you say he's going to be healed, then he has to be healed. And if he's not healed, then you are not an apostle of God. So much so one time, the dear sister had to grab her husband's, uh, grab her husband and say, just stay here with me while this brother goes crazy and, and does his little apostolic rant about what he thinks I should be as an apostle and what he thinks I should do as an apostle. And it's very likely, and I'm not going to make any sweeping statements at all, but it's likely that the Lord, it wouldn't be beyond the Lord, to not heal our brother. Yes, sir. While you were thinking in that incorrect position. And that it has nothing to do with what our our apostolic sister said. It has everything to do with your mental and emotional state. I want to tell you. What I feel, and I'm going to say what I feel. That we got to follow the Spirit. After we get done here tonight, I don't know if everybody in here is going to be saved. I'm telling you. Because as I'm talking, I, I I feel like there's some people letting go of Jesus. As I'm talking. Don't let that be you. And so they were, they were blasting our sister. And he ha- you have to be healed. We have more faith than you. We have more faith in you than you have in you. And if he did die, what I would do is I would come and get you and demand. They didn't say demand. And demand in their spirit. I demand that you come over, drive the seven hours, and raise him from the dead. Because you said it, and if you said it, you must do it like I think. And I tell you, it's not so. That's right. Our brother is a saved man. If he died right now, if the Lord took him right now, that does not change the prophecy. And we are founded on prophecy and not on your feelings. Amen. 
We are founded on prophecy and not somebody's mistake. And I'm not suggesting that our sister did make a mistake. I'm only saying if she did, so what? I'm not minimizing our brother. I love our brother. Do I want him to be healed? Yes, I want him to be healed. But he's not healed on your demand at your thoughts. Brother, if I was God, I wouldn't have healed our brother either. And if I was brother froze, I'd be upset with all y'all knuckleheads for, for blocking my healing. If God would have healed him, it would have justified you in your false position. Furthermore, if God would have allowed you to call the Global Brethren business entity the Apostles' Feet, that would mean that all the money that came together locally would be controlled by that local business entity and the board that is established, and it would have never gotten to the Apostles' Feet. It would have been at the feet of the men that were on the board who would have never transferred it to the apostles' feet. Ask me how I know. The reason I know is because when we said that's not the apostles' feet, the men that lost their charge got upset. They got upset. The reason they got upset is because they wouldn't control the money. The reason they got upset is because it wouldn't be at their feet. Brother, if you lay money down at the apostles' feet and the feet move left, what do you care? You're laying down money at the apostles' feet and the feet are not where you thought they should be. And so you start crying like a baby. Well, brother, the Bible says, how beautiful are the feet. And if you are not that, you need to shut your mouth. I say it, I say it in love, but you need to shut your mouth. And if I didn't love you, I wouldn't even say this to you. I'd let you go on in your delusion. Amen. Then, then you would have a global brethren business entity that is controlled locally. That never ever gets anywhere except Chihuahua. Or Zacatecas. Or Kempeche. At my choice. Or can I get a little closer? Or Haiti. There's a hundred thousand dollar building in Haiti for no reason. That's right. Today, you know why? Private funds. Private burdens. Private things happening. And today the building's not able to be used because the ones that were able to set it up did not have the resources at their feet. And if it was at their feet, we wouldn't have done it like that. That was a private endeavor done by people that had money. And I'm not saying they're not saved. I love them. They're just operating like they're always operated. But it's time out for that right now. It's time out for that right now. Brother, the stuff is supposed to come to the apostles' feet. Yes. That would mean if you want to build a building locally, you could build it. Because in your business entity, yes, you have the funds locally. It's at the feet. And you can have a nice little German, white mm-hmm. colony. Yeah, right. mm-hmm. While Chicago needs a building, Warsaw needs a building, people are dying. People don't have what the money they need. And you can have everything you need. Because the money's at your feet. And it will never be sent to the apostles. And there would never be an equality. And there would be this dissension in the church of God. Or this inequality. We would have rich churches and poor churches. We would have German churches and black churches. We'd have mingled churches. And I'm telling you, we're never going to do such a thing. Ever. Ever. We don't believe in that. We don't believe in that. It's against our religion. It's against the church of God. And so, y'all can sit down. I, I'm almost, uh, I'm just getting through a foundation. And so they didn't think, they didn't think that the global brethren business entity, they thought it should be the apostles' feet. And when they found out it wasn't, they started crying. They're still crying. And they still don't know what to do. And they've lost all their courage. 
which proves that they never had courage in the first place. Money. It's been falsely told by good brethren that Brother Steve said he has no idea what to do with money. He has no idea what to do with it. He, he told us himself. That is not what I said. Amen. That is not what I said. I think the brothers that said that said it honestly. And let, let me tell you what I said. Can I tell you what I said? Yeah. Because I see where they get that, but th they're incorrect. I didn't say that. Let me tell you what I said. We were up in a meeting in Elma. And I was talking to them. I said, really, brothers? This is what I said. Really, brothers, I don't really care about money like that. It's not that special to me. I don't need a new car, a new house, a new, new boat. And the reason I said that is because, and, and by the way, I do not think I'm the best money handler in the world. I am not saying that. I'm just simply saying it's not true that I said I don't know what to do with money. That's not true. I didn't say that. I said I don't care about money like that. Why would you say that, brother? Well, because after, uh, after I was not able to live with my wife, and after things looked a little bit rough for me way back in 1997, I didn't really see a reason to buy a nice house and a picket fence and hang up a picture of nobody. And so I didn't care about that. So much did I not care about that stuff that I begged Brother Lane to let me just go out, because I knew I could cut hair. Let me go out. I can cut hair and get $50 here and there when I need it. And I don't want to go to school. Brother Lane made me go to Barber College. I didn't want to go because I don't care about money like that. I'm not striving for this world's riches. And while I'm enjoying this, my life, I'm thankful for my life. I'm glad to be alive and I don't want to die. I want to live and serve the Lord. And at the same time, I'm not having that much fun here. Not that much fun. I want Jesus to come back. But, and so I don't care. And so I don't care about money like that. I wasn't supposed to preach. I was just supposed to talk to you. all I don't care about money like that. I don't care about money like that. I even laugh at people that do because they're miserable people. Miserable. Always oh, trying to make a deal. I got to hold the money. I got to get the money. Give me money. Give me the money. Give me money. That's too much money. Too. You, you, you're cheap. You're sorry. You're, you're sad. Be like me. Be happy. You say, brother, but if I'm like you, I won't have any money. True. But you'll know what it means to have teardrops fall from your eyes onto your Bible. And you'll know what it's like to be blessed. And you'll know what it's like to call somebody with fire burning in your soul. And it's found in the scriptures. And you'll know what it's like to drive your little used car down the highway and beep, beep, beep. While all the city's looking at this madman with a bearded afro. And, and so pardon me very much, but you can have your little piece of money. I'll take my treasure. So I'm not overly impressed with you. I love you, but you, are, you don't impress me. I think you're shallow. I think I have better devotions than you. I think I love better than you. I think I have better relationships than you. At least I think I do. So don't tell me if I don't, because I'm at least deceived enough to make me happy. <laughs> y'all know I'm right, and I'm going to tell you something else. I, let me, I'm going to tell y'all something else. Y'all know I'm right. Can I tell you something else? Y'all love me. Even if right now you don't want to. <laughs> I remember when he came here, and now he's up here telling us and lining us out. That's right. Deal with it. That's what it is. And you love me. And you got to love me to be right. And if you don't love me right now, you're not saved. And so I want to talk to you about money. Y'all some hard-working folks in the low German-speaking culture. Y'all have some glory to bring to nations to help everybody understand. But you are, in practice, prejudiced, oftentimes. And you're independent. There are people in here that are independently wealthy. 
that don't give what they should give. Amen. And I want to tell you something. You can't have money in the bank, a lot of money in the bank, while there are needs and go to heaven. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Amen. You can't have a lot of money in the bank Amen. while there are needs all over the work of God Amen. and you go to heaven. Amen. You and your money will go to hell. Right. That is sure. Amen. There's no doubt about it. Because your money was not given you so that you can buy some more land, another tractor, another car or truck. Your money was given you by God to be used at His discretion. Yes. I wish somebody that, that loved Jesus would say amen. amen. All right. Some of you didn't hear me. Say, some of you, I didn't hear you say amen, but it's all right. The others masked you. Your money is not your own. You are not your own. The breath you breathe is not your own. And it is God that giveth thee power to get well. You can't be independently wealthy. Because we have all things common. Amen. If you got a lot of bread, you need to start slicing some of it up. Yes, sir. Amen. I hope y'all understand my analogy. If you have a big loaf of bread, you need to slice some up. And I'm not talking about giving somebody a little piece of the hill. I'm talking about you keep the hill. You keep the hill and feed the hungry. Do you want to lay something down at the apostles' feet? Well, go ahead and lay it down at the feet. Go ahead and lay it down. I mean, do you want that to happen? Yes, I do. Or I did until I was discouraged. Well, stop being discouraged and lay it down. Saints back what God is doing with their life, their all, and their money. And the pattern of companies in the church of God. If you want to know how your company and your business should be, I'm going to tell you right now. Your company and your business should be just like Central Concrete. Amen. You say, but Central Concrete's broke. Yes. Central Concrete's broke. Providing a place for your babies to grow up as virgins. Yes. And the reason why your little daughter is not out there with a little Mexican baby or a little German baby is because she's been taught by somebody in the church of God that was supported by the company called Central Concrete. Amen. That's the reason. That's the reason. You're not that great. Amen. You're not that good of a parent. Amen. There is a structure that's in place that allows you to have good children and you need to acknowledge it and it's time to pay. You got to pay to have a virgin daughter. Brother, if your daughter's a virgin, you owe a check, a big one, six figures. Say, I can't believe he said it. I'm not taking it back. And, And while I'm on a roll, since everybody loves me, I came here tonight, we came here tonight to get some money. Amen. Hold on. Amen. I'm going to walk down here a little bit. Amen. And I'm going to stand up and make sure everybody understood what I said. We came here tonight to get some money. Amen. But don't worry. You don't have to give no money. You don't have to give any money. I already told you I don't care about money. I'm, I'm blessed. If you don't give any money, I'm not getting it anyway. But if you don't give any money, I wasn't even supposed to preach. If you, don't, if you don't give any money, God will raise up enlargement and deliverance from another place. But you and your household will be lost. And so tonight, we came to get some money. We plan on flying back tomorrow with our pockets full of your money that's the Lord's. Ain't a lot of shouting now, but it's true. Now, remember what I said. You don't have to give it. But if you don't give it, we're not going to call you saved. Oh, brother, you're just pressuring me now. There's a lot of pressure. And it, what happened to a free will offering? It is free will. Do it or don't. Pick one. It is free will. You don't have to do it. You give money or you don't. You're a free moral agent. You give or you don't. Now, wait a minute. Calm down. Brother Steve. You don't understand. Calm down. I don't have any money, brother. Because I reinvested it. (laughs) 
I don't have any money. I reinvested the money to make more lands and more houses and more fruit and more corn and more tractors and more truck. I reinvested. You just didn't know I reinvested it. Listen, I should have known. Amen. We should have known. Because don't know, don't know millions of dollars flow through the church of God without the fathers of the community knowing it. Yeah, you, you can have some money, but you need to have it like central concrete. And we are moving in the direction, dear one. So I'm giving you fair warning because so you can run out today. Because I don't, I don't have to go back with any money. I can just go back and say, hey, brother, they didn't give me any money. And say, well, that's all right. Well, then we've established who's a saint and who's not. <laughs> so how much money are you talking about, brother? A lot. I'm being serious. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm being serious. I'm talking about a lot of money. Yes, Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Tonight, brother? Tonight. Tonight. Yes, yes. I, I don't have that. You might not have it all right now, because I know it ain't harvest time yet. But you can't convince me. Ain't nobody in this room can convince me you don't have no money under your mattress somewhere. I would say somebody say amen, but it's getting tight in here. So you don't say amen. Watch me say it. Amen. 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 Can't, tell, can't convince me you don't have no money. Of course you have money. You have millions. You have millions, and we ain't never seen it. And we're renting in Warsaw. We're renting a building in Warsaw. And Chicago needs a building. And there are souls dying while you buy land. What's wrong with buying land? Everything. Everything, if you do it by your own self. You need to be like Central Concrete. Take a salary. This is my salary. And you might be able to struggle through if you take $100,000 U.S. a year. That would be hard to make it. 100000 U.S. is how many pesos? Over 200. I mean, that's equivalent. Like if I went to the U.S., that's equivalent over $200,000. And I realized that it would be very hard to live of such a small sum, it'd be hard to. But somehow you might have to squeeze out the ability mm -hmm. to live off something so small. I hope I'm not boring you. I told somebody today, I told somebody today, you're not saved. I just told him that. And then guess what else I said? I said, if you want to get saved, you've got to write a check, a big one. I, said, I, I, I thought you can't pay for salvation. You can't. That's just a good start. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. Money. Brother. Building colonies. Building businesses. Building entities. Buying fields. Buying houses. Buying trucks. Buying corn. Buying apples. Buying all kinds of things. Independently. And then can't give this locality. I'm talking about this locality. Can't give $1,500 a month for the mission. That's a lie. I'm, tell, I'm telling y'all. Come on, y'all. Y'all got to agree with me now. You got to agree with me. It is a lie that you can't give $1,500 a month. And don't say that because you'd be a liar. You wouldn't be saved. That's a lie. You can support the whole mission from this locality. We can do anything we want to do in the restoration from this locality. Oh, but we can't. We can't. Because you got your own little agenda. Meanwhile, you're looking at people that have given up all, given up their life, given up their money, refused to get a job, refused to do these things, going and living and dying, working for the gospel. And yeah, that kind of hurts a little bit. Every time I get a little chest pain for working for the gospel... Uh, uh, and sometimes a big one, I think, all oh, them rich folk over there, y'all are rich. Yes. Mm -hmm. And y'all are rich. I, somebody say amen. amen. You, I mean, no, I'm talking about some of y'all rich ones need to say amen. amen. Y'all rich. Hundred, I'm serious. Some of y'all rich ones need to say amen. Y'all yeah. got hundreds of thousands of dollars going through your hands. You're rich. Yeah. Okay, don't say amen. Well, we got one that said amen. Thank the Lord. One said, Amen. More power to you. God bless you. You got hundreds of thousands of dollars running through your hands. 
you're rich. You're rich. And it's not a problem being rich. The problem is you are independently rich. And what needs to happen is you need to stop squawking about the apostles' feet and put some of that money at the apostles' feet. What will happen when we do that? Well, then that will be at the, at, the, at the convenience of the apostles. Well, what will happen with my business? That's none of your business. <laughs> I've tried. It's all right. They'd be like, but I wonder what Brother Ray would say about this. Well, I do too sometimes. <laughs> I really do. I do too sometimes. Like, oh, God bless Brother Ray. I'm so glad he's a chief apostle. He's got to clean up all this. But the fact is that you're rich. Now, what you going to do with your riches? How come I haven't seen any? There it is. You want to buy a car? I have a car. I want to preach the gospel, and I want somebody to get saved. And by the way, you got your riches in somebody else's land. And I wonder how often you've thought to give them the money you owe them. Yes, sir. All right. yes, sir. When's the last time you gave some Mexicans the money you owe them? Yes. Amen. Oh, I just want to give you, hey, I, I got, I'm going to give you this money because hey, I got this on your land. But no, you're going to strap, we're going to have our own little colony, our own little ways, our own little mind. And God forbid that the apostles say something contrary to what I thought because then I'll sit down and suck eggs. And there's a reason why the Lord said, be not afraid of their faces, because some of y'all's faces would make somebody afraid if they wasn't stupid as me. <laughs> some of y'all's faces would make somebody afraid, but except me, I'm too, I'm too dumb to get afraid. I'm just going ahead. I'm just going ahead and keep saying it. But I'm looking, I'm looking at your face. But my God told me, be not afraid of their faces. And if I could preach you out of the church of God tonight, I would say good riddance. If I could preach you out of the church of God, I'd say bye-bye. Listen, I looked at my own wife and said, bye, sweetie. I'm serving the Lord. So it'd be a small thing for me to look at you and say that. I'm kind of used to doing that. <laughs> they say his wife left him. I left her. <laughs> Y'all didn't know that, did you? I left her. Some of you didn't even know I was married. I left her. Why? Because she didn't want to come this way. So you understand why I don't understand why you have a problem. I don't understand. Too much money. Brethren, what else was I going to say? I preached in, I preached in Greenville about how Central Concrete had done very well for us. And before I closed, there were women, children, and saints pulling out their wallet in Greenville. This just happened. Pulling out their wallet, reaching in their purses, going to get their checkbook. And on the spot with no notice, they raised in a poor place. They wasn't rich like y'all. They raised in a poor place thousands. On the spur of the moment, no notice, no chance to save, they raised it. And I'm telling you tonight, oh, I know what I was going to say. Tonight, we came here to collect on a debt. We've been good to you. Brother Ray's been good to you. You've been eating good food. Your children are saved. They're in a safe place. We've never molested your children. You don't have to worry about sexual misconduct. We've never abused your wives. We've never abused your sons. We've treated you well, loved you, prayed for you, stayed up late at night, labored for you hours and hours, and poured out our very soul. And now it's time to pay. It's time to pay. Pay. Pay the Lord. Pay the Lord. It's time to pay. Otherwise, if you don't pay, you're not as good as a businessman as you thought you were. Because businessmen recognize the debt that's due and they pay their obligations because they understand how this works. And if you're really a businessman, then it's time for you to drop some money because you understand what I'm saying is accurate. You understand what I'm saying is accurate. I'm accurate tonight. If you think I'm not accurate, you're not much of a businessman. You just fell on some, you just fell on some fortunate times. Brother John Radikoff is a man of God. Brother John Radikoff 
is a man of God. Amen. He is in the bosom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, and if you're not on your feet right now, you are probably not saved. I'm going to say it again. If you're not on your feet right now, you're probably not a Christian. Amen. Or you need translation. That brother is a man of God. <clears throat> it has been said before to you in years past that we could just take him away. And we'd use him anywhere. And everybody would love him. If I brought him to Warsaw, the saints in Warsaw wouldn't mind if he was their pastor. I'm their pastor and they wouldn't mind if he was their pastor. They'd be like, Brother Steve, just hang around. We love you. But it's all right if we put that man there. We can put him anywhere, and, and the people would flourish. He's got glory coming, coming out of his soul. He's got tears coming out of his eyes. He's a shepherd after the Lord's own heart. And if you don't know what to do with him, we'll take him away. Yes. Lest you think that's a threat. If we don't get some money tonight, you are dishonoring him. And we're not having service here tomorrow. We'll lock up our building. And we'll take our pastor and take him somewhere to some people that will pay and be grateful. Yes. Yes. Amen. See if I'm serious if I walk away without any money. It sounds like a threat to me. It's not a threat. That's what it is. You won't have service tomorrow. And if you think I'm playing, let tomorrow come. And when you don't have service, you'll know. Yeah, that, bro that brother really did mean that we're not having service. Mm -hmm. He really did mean that. And then you can, you can find your way back to the Philistine land or to, you can serve Ashtoreth or Diana. You can go back to the old colony or the Kleingemeinde. You can go back to all those places that will let you have your independent wealth. But we're not doing that here. Amen. That is a good brother that we set here. Yes. And you owe money for him. Yes. We bought him a house, brother. Listen. He's worth more than that house, and I think he's making some of the payment anyway. He's a man of God. You are to listen to him, to obey him. If you, if you listen to him, you'll do well. If you don't, you'll do ill. And so we've come to a place of an impasse. Please do not play or attempt to play one apostle against another. Amen. Don't leave from this meeting and call your favorite apostle because all of us are subject one to another and have one mind. Yes. Amen. Amen. And we did not come here. The reason the, you might think I'm crazy and I'm saying some wild things, but the reason I'm not alone is because you need to know that this is coming from the apostles. It's not coming from Brother Steve's wild brain. The apostles think you should pay tonight. The apostles are tired of having a wealthy congregation and not seeing any of the money. Amen. Amen. Yes, you give out of your excess. But tonight, I want you to give until you are in pain. And then, and then, you might be able to tell your wife you love her tomorrow. You might be able to hug your daughter. Some of that German background that everybody talks about is there. That might be rubbed off. Because it's just an excuse. We're all people. And you might feel closer to God when you bring your savings account down very low. To about $1,000. That's all you need. And then we have ongoing monetary giving to the apostles' feet. Saints, we are at an impasse here. We're very serious. We are moving in the direction, and I'm closing. We are moving in the direction, as the church of God, of having only one purse. That means all the offering that you take here goes to one locality. We're moving in that direction. When will it be? We're moving that direction and the Lord moves fast. I don't know. We'll meet with the apostles. But we're moving that direction. Why? So that there can be an equality. 
so one rich congregation can't buy a big rec center while somebody else is living in a shack with a tin roof and all of us claiming to be church of God? What about the companies? We're going to go after the pattern of central concrete. Why? So we all can be broke? No. Central held us down, and we won't all be broke if we do it that way. It'll be at the apostles' feet. And saints, if you don't want to do that, then you may leave. And we love you, but there'll be more glory in here. <coughs> You want to have some more glory in service tomorrow? Are you serious about serving God? You're lying if you don't give any money. How serious? Are you serious about it? I'm serious. Well, let's see how serious you are. How serious are you? Brethren. We are going to depart. Brother Radikoff will tell us if there's any money that's been collected. If there's not, may the Lord bless you and go where you will tomorrow. Find some nice church home that will let you do that. And there are plenty, there are plenty that will let you do that. But if you want to serve God, Show God that you want to serve him. Reach deep into your pockets and pull out some of the Lord's money that you've held on to for years. And saints, this is not the most comfortable thing to you, but you know that I'm right. You know, you know I'm right. You're, you're like, that, that brother's right. And it's time for you to come on up on that. Come up off that brother. Amen. Thank you for your time. If you, brethren, have anything to say, I'll allow that, please.